What up, YouTube? It's time to brew some beer. Today we're going to be making my Christmas ale. I've made this, uh, I made a Christmas ale last year and I'm not sure why it took me so long to start doing this, um, but I'll give you guys the grain bill and uh, I get all this stuff from Adventures in Home Brewing. I put this in as one recipe to save the order so that I can order it every year. Um, I'm not going to do anything di different with it this year. I'm going to make it exactly like I did last year because I really, really liked it. It was a little bit sweet last year, so I'm going to see if I can let it ferment out just a little bit longer this time. Um, but the flavor was fantastic. Alcohol content was good. So as of now, we're making Ho 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 Volume 2, my Christmas ham. You guys are familiar with the brew house. So I got my strike water up to temperature. Now I gotta get 4.6 gallons in here, that's my mashing bowl. We are at 163. Where are we at? Three and a half. We're getting there. All these new stainless steel kettles are really easy to work with. Um, I, I'm using the Bayou Classic, I probably mentioned that in a couple of the videos that I've done. I really love these things. For price point, you cannot be a, they're, they're thin enough they, they're easy to drill out whenever you're putting your taps on and stuff like that. And for just a home brewer like me, he, he doesn't want to drop, you know, $1,000 on pots and pans and stuff like that. These things are awesome. Four, eight, five. And these Bayou Classic, uh, they are bang for your buck. Stainless steel, crazy easy to clean. Um, and not too heavy weight for just moving around whenever you're cleaning and stuff like that. And I'm really kind of wishing I had switched my mash tun to a stainless steel earlier because I really cut down on my cleanup time. This brew is a fairly hefty brew. It's got pretty strong alcohol content. I'll check the sheet. The exact percentage for the oven during the holiday season. And if you've got a bunch of family coming to Griswold your house, it'll keep you festive. So we should be mashing for an hour at 152. I didn't show you before I uh, filled this up, but this does have a false bottom in it. Same false bottom I was using in the cooler when I made that mash ton, but it fits in here, works fine. Had to get a different um, hose to connect, but that's it. Everything else I just transferred over from the, from the cooler I was using to this. Now what's surprising is this doesn't lose as much heat as I thought it would. I thought the cooler, the insulation effects of the cooler would make it harder for me to keep my temperatures balanced with the stainless steel. And that is not the case. We didn't get quite the temperature drop that we normally get. Um, guessing just the grains were warmer or whatnot. 154. That I know this needs to be at in order to hold my mash at 152. Usually I keep a large volume of water in here, more than I need to actually sparge with. The reason being, it's just easier to hold temperature. There's less fluctuations with more water. But the downside is when you go to uh, ramp up the mash out, I gotta bring this up to 190. It takes a lot longer, you know, to get nine or 10 gallons of water up to 190 than it does five or six. I wanna get a better sparge system here. And just try and get this, the, the end of this propped up enough to where it's kind of keeping on top of the grain bed. Or 160, so we need to drop this down eight degrees. And we're 152 over here. So we'll just give it a little bit of time for everything to settle in. I'm gonna lower my flame down to next to nothing. I don't use these for, I don't use these for hops. Uh, I found that if you put hops in these, it, because of how fine the mesh is, 
it just clogs up the, uh, the mesh and you know, the, it, it just makes a mess. So what I use this for is I put the hops directly in the boil and then I use this for any additives that will clog my pump when I start the whirlpool. Uh, for like a blue moon, it'd be your coriander, it's gonna be, for this one, it's gonna be a star anise. All that kind of stuff, I put it in there, that way it doesn't go through the circulation and jam up my pump. And then we gotta bring this up to 190 for our mash out. So we'll keep it circulating the whole time uh, as it raises the temperature, but we're just gonna increase the heat. Start bringing this up to mash out temperature. <laughs> and my gas is in the yellow, which means I'm gonna go grab my spare tank because I'm probably gonna lose, uh, run out of gas while the boil. The whole goal here is to maintain the water volume that's in here right now. So we don't, we want both of these to be running at the same rate. Same amount of sparge water that's coming in is the same amount of work that's going out. Christmas ale looks like. I'm gonna open up this valve here, drain a little bit quicker, because what I don't wanna do is I don't wanna get to boil volume and have a bunch of extra wasted water in here. Not water, wort. So I try and drain the bed down when I get it close to where I think we've got enough left in here. If I have to rinse it with a little bit more at the end, I will, but I just like to waste, or I like to draw out, use this process to get as many of the, uh, the wort and the sugars out as I can increases my brew house efficiency. Some of these things that I've been doing, um, if you looked at one of my starter videos, I wasn't doing all this stuff when I first started. My brew house efficiency has gone way up just with little things like this, you know, getting all that you can out of the grains. Recirculation obviously helps with brew house efficiency. Um, a slower transfer um, during the sparge helps with brew house efficiency. All these things add up to a boost. The Beersmith app, actually has a calculator where it knows the volumes, it knows the grain, uh, the, the amount of grains that you're using. So what it tells you to do is it gives you a specific amount of water to sparge with. Uh, and it will say, you know, sparge with three and a half gallons of water at 90, at 190 degrees. I need to start measuring what's in my water tank, in my, uh, my hot liquid tank, so that I'll know once it gets down to a certain level, that's when I cut it off and I should have enough water rather than just doing this guesstimation. So tip for next video, to me, I need to get more in depth on measuring my water volumes in my hot liquid tank. So we're at five and we're getting pretty low. So hopefully we've got another gallon and a half left here. If not, we'll spritz this with some, some water because we still got some, but I think we might be good. We got our candy sugar, Belgian, Belgian dark rock candy, our hop additions, the star anise, and I gotta go grab my cinnamon sticks. Six gallons, and we just want to put run off a little bit more. Well, six and a half gallons is just to give us enough for boil off. Um, because boil off, I usually lose about a gallon during the 60 minute boil. Uh, so that puts us at five and a half. And then there's some trub loss in there for a recipe like this, done. just that brought us down, because we're going for a five gallon batch. And there we are, six and a half. Put this hot break going on. I'm gonna turn my flame down to keep it just a rolling boil. I 
I turn up the fire at this point as well to increase the boil so that when I'm, st when I'm sterilizing uh, my wort chiller and stuff like that. And we have our cinnamon stick, our nutmeg, and our ginger. There it is. Smells like Christmas. You can see what I mean about this thing clogging. I mean, even, even just with the hops on the outside. And then what I do is after I transfer this, I'm gonna put it in the uh, fermenter pull out the sample so I can check the uh, starting gravity and I let it sit in the uh, fermentation chamber to reach the proper temperature of 70 degrees for the ferment in this act. I pull the sample, our starting gravity is 1.063. Check our volume. Perfect. We are at 5.25 on the dot. I mean, perfect. You usually lose a right from the pitch. We use a cool, I lose a quarter of a gallon. We're gonna pitch our yeast, which has been uh, our yeast starter, which has been going for right a, a little over 24 hours. Fix our blow off. And here we go. You might notice the lack of a Christmas hat. This brew got switched up. I was making my Christmas ale, my ho, 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 and I screwed up one of the major steps, the candy sugar. So I was supposed to put that in during the mash and I uh, forgot, ended up throwing it in during the boil. Does make a big difference when it goes in because the fermentation did not, didn't ferment the same. So this one uh, changed from ho, ho, ho to my New Year's ale. The alcohol content is lower, the fermentation got to a point where I thought it had stalled. So I just gave it a little bit more time, fluctuated the temperature, but then it turned out, no, it actually completed. It just wasn't gonna ferment out anymore. Ended up with an ABV of 6.1, which is lower than my Christmas ale, but that accounts for the fact that the candy sugar didn't completely ferment out. This one's good, I do enjoy it. Changed the name to New Year's Ale because as you can see by the lack of a Christmas hat, did not make it for Christmas. But made it in time for the New Year's and I'm enjoying it. It's a little bit sweeter than my Christmas brew because of the fermentation stopped uh, short of all those candy sugars, but I do enjoy it. Good flavor, it's got the aroma and all those spices and stuff that you like in a Christmas ale. It just doesn't have as quite as much alcohol content as the normal Christmas ale does and it's a little bit sweeter. But all in all, successful brew. Even when you make mistakes, sometimes you still make something delicious. Keep on brewing, y'all.